This book is um, a labor of love, and um, it's primarily a book of images and quotes. Uh, most of the images are from Asia, Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, um, as well as Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, oh, not Laos, and Burma. So um, what I've done is paired images inspired by Kuan Yin, uh, the goddess of compassion in the Buddhist tradition, with quotes by women teachers from the time of the Buddha to the present day. And um, we actually have one of those teachers in our audience tonight. So I want to start here, let's see if I can do this quickly, with a quote by Sandy Boucher. Sandy Boucher wrote the foreword for this book, and she's the author of Discovering Kuan Yin and many other books on feminism and Buddhism. And she starts with this quote, within every civilization there is a yearning for the divine feminine. Within every civilization there is a yearning for the divine feminine. She goes on to say, we want to see our spiritual guides embodied not just in the iconic male representations, but in female form. Now, a lot of people say to me, particularly Buddhists, say, well, doesn't that, um, doesn't that, that has nothing to do with gender, right? Well, I love her answer, and this is what I'd love to say next time somebody asks me. <laughs> no matter how many times we are told that enlightenment transcends gender, and I'm sure it does. Still, we are left with all the gender differences and inequities that operate in our daily lives, whether we are men or women. And so we hunger to see femaleness mirrored in the figures that inspire us. How many of you hunger for that? <laughs> okay. What I've done is, this is an image that I paired with her quote. Um, the images go side by side with quotes or text. And this is from uh, Taipei, a uh, temple in Taipei named Longshan. It is the temple to go if you're in Taiwan. It's beautiful. It's big. There are hundreds of people going in and out. And in order to get this picture, I had to get my way through the crowd, get up to this beautiful image that's about five, six feet tall. It's behind bars and plastic. So <laughs> I was very happy to even capture something of it. Um, but it's a rare Kuan Yin with a fire halo. And what's very interesting, I was when I was in Taiwan, there was a teacher there named Wu Shan, Master Wu Shan, and she oversees a, um, a group of nuns there called the Luminary Nuns. Uh, Westerners have written about this group of nuns as a group of feminist nuns. They don't call themselves that, but being there, I understand why. Um, but she wanted me to go to the temples where miracles had occurred, where there were images of Kuan Yin. Uh, where special circumstances had occurred. And this image is in a temple that was burned to the ground uh, when the Japanese bombed Taiwan in the early 40s. And the only thing that survived was this statue. So she's, um, crowds just massively pour into this temple to pay respect, to pray, to uh, work their mala beads, to meditate. So it felt like it was so wonderful to be there with these people. And what's interesting about Kuan Yin is she is a Buddhist figure, but the Taoists also um, pay respect and honor to Kuan Yin. So many of these Chinese-inspired temples, uh, Kuan Yin is originally from um, China. Uh, she's the transformation of Avalokiteshvara who is an Indian figure of compassion in Buddhism. When Buddhism came to China in about 100, 200 AD, uh, 
Chinese fell in love with this figure of compassion. By about 8, 900 AD, he became a she. I call her the first transgendered goddess. <laughs> so, um, and what's very interesting, um, researching, researching images of her in China, which I have not been to yet. Um, my husband and I will be there this summer. But um, there are statues going up everywhere of Kuan Yin. 253 feet tall is the tallest one. Our tallest statue in the United States is the Statue of Liberty, 151 feet tall. So statues, I mean, this phenomenon is not just happening in the United States are in the Western world. Um, the East is going gaga for her. She has always been a very important figure, but there were statues of the Buddha, um, 250 feet tall, um, developed around 800 AD, but nothing of Kuan Yin like this. But now she is the ma major figure that is having this humongous statues. So um, I'm going to have to work to not say too much, I can tell already. This statue is also in Taiwan, and it's an image at the Dharma Drum um, Monastery in northern Taiwan. It was one of my favorite. I saw the image before I came to um, Taiwan on the internet, this little fuzzy image, and I said, I have to see this. I have to photograph her. Um, she's about eight feet tall which always shocks me. When I first wrote down how tall she was, I said, well, she's about 20 feet tall. So, um, but her pedestal is quite high. <laughs> so um, she was very lovely. And I paired this, this statue with a quote by a woman named Dei Huang Sunim. And um, let's get these out of order a little bit. Here we go. And Dei Huang Sunim is a Korean Zen master. And she just died last year. I was very sad. I was hoping to be able to get to, to Korea before she died. Um, but she began her practice at six years old. Her family had been, um, uh, ended up in the forest dwelling in a hut during actually a war also with Japan. And um, her father was very um, aggressive and abusive with her. And she started wandering in the woods. And by eight years old, she was doing this full time. She wandered until she was 18 years old by herself. A group of monks adopted her and fed her. And um, she uh, became interested in the practice of Buddhism. And they said, OK, you can come sit with us. And after about a day, she said, I'm not going to ruin my knees. <laughs> and she wandered in the woods with the Buddhist teachings for 12 more years. After that, she came back and sat. And she has the biggest following in Korea of any master. She um, has monks for students, which is unheard of in these countries, um, that they would have a, a nun as a teacher. Um, quite uh, an inspiring woman. So here's the quote that um, I want to read you that I put in the book, paired with this image. Spiritual practice means having faith that there is a great treasure within your mind and then finding it. Learning to discover the treasure within you is the most worthwhile thing in the world. If you can put this into practice, you can live freshly with a mind open like the sky, always overflowing with compassion. What could be better than this? What could be better than this? I noticed as I was picking quotes out that I was drawn to the poetic and also drawn to the ecstatic. 
and I think she's beginning to point at this. We don't often associate Buddhism with ecstasy, do we? You know, we're just supposed to sit and sit. <laughs> you know, that, that's a sort of stereotype, you know, and trudge through it. Um, but I think she's saying there's something amazing here, something worthwhile, something that is a treasure. And it's our minds. So she uses this very substantial metaphor, this treasure that you can find. But then she's saying the treasure is a mind that is open like the sky. Such a beautiful image. Now, a Buddhist term we've often heard is emptiness. It doesn't quite sound so appealing, does it? <laughs> you know, it's interesting, I was thinking about the Western sort of um, idea of emptiness. And it's actually, when people feel empty, it's one of the diagnostic descriptions of of mental illness. So that's sort of the Western sort of prejudice towards this particular word. We have a hard time just accepting that it's okay. And she's saying it's more than empty. It's more than it's more than okay. It's open like the sky. This treasure. And then when it's open like the sky, free of prejudice, free of filters, free of our veils or colorations. When it's totally free, when we can see the world freshly, when we can see each other, when we can see ourselves, our compassion flows naturally. This is a nun we met in um, outside of Myanmar um, in, uh, or in, in Burma. Um, we were visiting Say Agin, which is a small town where there's 25,000 nuns that just happen to live in this area and live in monasteries. They're in universities. They're, they're quite sophisticated. And this is actually a woman that was a tribal woman who joined this monastery when she was young. She was the um, attendant to the abbess that we were visiting that we just happened to find out about and meet through our motorcycle taxi driver. <laughs> he was so sweet. He took us to all these temples and then we, and I was telling him I was interested in women. He says, oh, I'll take you somewhere. So he took us to this monastery of 250 women and the abbess was 89 years old. I have an image of her in the book also. And this woman uh, and the image was taking an exam the next day, the Abhidharma, this very sort of um, uh, difficult uh, text to learn in, in the Buddhist tradition. And so she'd attend to the teacher, and then the teacher would be absorbed in something else, and then she'd go sit in this corner and read. And when she first sat down, I thought, oh, look at the light. It's like you know, backlighting her. She was so gorgeous. And so I turned to the taxi driver, the motorcycle taxi driver, and I said, could you please ask her not to move so I can take her picture? <laughs> so it was, it was quite a treat. Those sorts of things don't happen all the time. So I've paired a quote with her um, by a teacher named Thin Thin. Just to give you a little of the international flavor, Thin Thin was a physician in Burma. She was Chinese, and she was studying with these sort of um, uh, very liberal monks there. And she's a lay teacher, and she um, uh, eventually found her way to Bangkok to become a teacher, and now she has her, her sangha in California. Um, she's also quite old at this point. But, but this is the quote. Freedom is not just an end result. It is not something that awaits us at the end of our endeavor. Freedom 
is instantaneous. Right now, from the beginning, we can be free in the very process of the search, in experiencing in every step along the way. That doesn't fit our stereotype either, does it? Of struggling, working, trying to understand, trying to get there, getting a glimpse of enlightenment. And I think what she's saying is those glimpses are there all the time. We have to open our eyes. We have to wake up in the instant. We can string them kind of like pearls on a strand, one at a time. Okay. This is an image of a woman in Vietnam, and she's in the Quan Am Temple in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. And she's lighting incense. And um, I don't know if she goes every day. She lives a few blocks away. This is the Chinatown of Saigon. I was, I mean, I was ignorant, but almost every major city in Asia has a Chinatown. Because diaspora, every time there was poverty, every time there was a famine, every time there was a revolution, people escaped to somewhere where they could eat somewhere where they could um, become employed. So um, a friend of mine commented, you know, I don't know why I paired this with this quote by Pema, which I'll read in a minute, but she said, you know, it looks like someone who makes that commitment to go to the temple, to light the incense, to remember her practice, so this is what Pema Chodron quotes in her book on when things fall apart. This is a quote I chose. Every day, at the moment when things get edgy, we can just ask ourselves. We can just ask ourselves. Am I going to practice peace? Or am I going to go to war? I like Pema's edginess with this question, you know, because we forget when we have that, when we get edgy and we have that little edge in our voice, whether we're talking to somebody else or even ourselves. When I say to myself, oh, I'm such an idiot, or I say to somebody else, what are you doing? What I like in Pema's quote, you know, it's those little beads we also put on a strand and we end up in war with each other, within ourselves, because those little things add up. And through mindful practice, we start to notice we're doing it to others or ourselves. And I just like, you know, because, you know, one is picking a fight and the other is laying down our arms and offering our arms to one another. Okay, this is that same temple. This is a um, young woman. The other woman was lighting the incense and she is placing them in her, in the urn with other sticks of incense. Um, and making her prayers. I paired this quote, or I paired this image with a quote by Judith Simmer Brown. How many of you know Judith Simmer Brown? Okay, she lives here in Boulder. She's a professor of religious studies at Naropa University, and she's been quite a mentor for me. And this is a quote from her book, Dakini's Warm Breath, that in 19, or 2001, I was here for her book signing. So, she says, 
When purified of self-centeredness, passion is expressed as devotion to others, caring skillfully and utterly about their welfare. It is also expressed as joy in living and appreciation of the unique beauty of each moment. This is also, I would say, a teaching we don't associate with Buddhism, particularly with a stereotype of it being passionless. Passion is considered one of um, what we can compare in Christianity to the seven deadly sins. But what she's saying is, at its root, is love. Is that its root is this strong energy of feeling. But instead of going out to grasp, we go out to give. We use that energy to give, to offer to others. Because we usually think, I love it, I'm going to have it. I love it, I'm going to offer myself to that, to you, to the other. And it's a powerful emotion. It's a powerful feeling. And it's also here we're, we're, we're I notice again we're having uh, words, joy, beauty. Those are things that are our inheritance in life. Those are things we discover when our mind is open like the sky. Because I see you totally clearly, if I can in that moment. You see me that way. You don't see my um, uh, strategic moves to get what I want. You see behind those strategic moves that what I'm desiring actually is connection and truth and beauty. Okay, here's the image for this one. This is in Japan. And these are statues in a garden setting outside a temple. And the one is, the close-up one is Jisu, um, who is a bodhisattva, also of compassion. It's, uh, he's often paired with Kuan Yin, or Kanan, Kanan, as it's known in um, as she is known in Japan. In Japan, you'll most often see her looking androgynous. Although a friend recently sent me an image from Japan of a town on the outskirts of um, Tokyo. This statue rising above these 10-story buildings of um, Kuan Yin holding a baby. But here Jizo is holding the baby. And Jiso is he he has such compassion that in this in the Pure Land tradition, a child not having the opportunity to um, lift their veils, the opportunity to clear their mind to become enlightened, um, will go to hell when they die. So Jisu escorts them to heaven. So it's, it's very interesting to me all, you know, when you go to countries, we, we kind of have the, um, the folk traditions of um, major religions, where we saw many examples of teachings on heaven and hell, where you go after, you know, you die, um, where the, the teachings that we mostly get in this country are what I call the cream of the crop, the hell and heaven are metaphors. But obviously, like here in the United States, they're often taken literally also. But here's the quote that I paired with this one by Zijong. Zijong was a um, abbess and a nun of China from about the 18th century in China, in mainland China. And she was a great teacher. Um, she uh, had many students. She also uh, was a poet. 
Uh, many teachers then were poets. And um, one time in her life, she got a year's sabbatical. And what nuns and monks would do in their sabbatical, they would wander the hills. They would go with another companion and wander the hills for a whole year. And this is a poem that comes from her wandering. I still recall how, with my bag on my pole, I forgot my yesterdays. Wandering the hills, played in the waters, went to the land of the clouds. The lift of an eyebrow, the blink of an eye, all of it, samadhi, all of it, samadhi. In this great world, there is nowhere that is not a wisdom hall. In this great world, there is nowhere that is not a wisdom hall. Okay. Here's a quote by um, a friend of mine and her co-author of The Feminine Face of God, who's with us today, uh, Patricia Hopkins. And um, this is near the end of their uh, fabulous book. I'm sure most of you have heard the title, The Feminine Face of God. I'm pairing it here with lotus buds. This image I took at the um, flower market in Bangkok. I got lost many times in Chinatown, which is very near the flower market, and I finally surrendered. This was it. <laughs> and there I found Huan Yin again. Um, the women are the ones that make these bouquets that are then sold to people who will take them to temples. This is a beautiful bouquet of lotus buds. And I thought it was an excellent companion to the quote uh, from Patricia and Sherry Ruth. There is no single savior being awaited. The savior is spread out among us, emerging from each of us as we bring the fruits from our sacred garden into our daily lives. The Savior is spread out among us, emerging from each of us as we bring the fruits from our sacred garden into our daily lives. It is we who must save us. This is the wisdom of Huan Yin. She brings it in a feminine form. This is about community. This is about each of us doing our part. This is about the belief in our sacred garden and that we can cultivate that ourselves with the help of others. This last quote I have is by a woman named Puna. She is, uh, she was one of the original women at the time of the Buddha. Um, the women supplicated the Buddha many times to be part of a Sangha, his following, learning students on the path. And three times he said no, and then eventually he said yes. This was rare. This was so rare back then. You know, women didn't do those things. So um, 
I like to think of it as the beginning of the women's liberation movement. <laughs> and liberation with a big L. Okay. The image, before I read it, the image is a Kwanian image from the Lotus Lantern Festival in Korea during the, at the time of Visak, or Wisak, however you want to say that. Um, a time of the Buddha's celebrating his birthday, his enlightenment, and his parinirvana, his, his death and um, nirvana, um, complete enlightenment. Um, this statue is about 20 feet tall. It's lit from the inside. It's made out of paper. There are about 10,000 people that march in this parade alone. They each carry a lighted lantern. And then at the end of the parade are these huge statues. There was a dragon 60 feet long, and it had fire coming out of its mouth. I have it in here also. And the children were running after the, the dragon, and the fire would come out of its mouth, and then they all scream and go away, and then they come back. Um, but I was so pleased to find this statue. This was one of the most fun things I've ever done. It's the culmination of one a month of practice at this time. Um, Many people come for the last three or four days of practice. And then the, the uh, Lotus Lantern Parade and Festival are part of that. Um, if you notice, I didn't notice this till I got home, but she has a mustache. <laughs> she doesn't look like the guys behind her, but sometimes it looked like here she is with a veil, which is the typical female image of Kuan Yin, and the bead, beaded necklace, which is the typical female image. And then it kind of looked to me like graffiti. But anyway, <laughs> I think it had to do with our mixed feelings. You know, this is a male image, it's a female image. How do we work with this? And this is how they figure it out. <laughs> so, at least for the parade. But I've also seen a few... Um, a few paintings like this. But that quote I paired with this by Puna, um, these quotes by the women of the Terigata, which are the women at the time of the Buddha, um, are songs, actually. And they're written sort of in poetic verse. So I have quotes um, that are translated both by this woman, Susan Murcott, that translated this one, and by um, Anne Waldman, that has also translated. Um, the Terigata, or parts of it. So, this is what Puna is saying to herself in this verse. Puna, be filled with all good things, like the moon on the 15th day, completely, perfectly full. Completely, perfectly full of wisdom. Tear open the massive dark. Tear open the massive dark. Kind of makes you want to do it. <laughs> I mean, what she's saying is, you know, put your passion here to your transformation, to removing the obstacles of ignorance and aggression, clinging. Mm. Put your energy here, put it all in here, and tear it open. Yeah. And again, tear open to that mind is open as the sky. So I want to leave you with one last image. See this? <laughs> this is also from the Lotus Lantern Festival. And it's a young girl sitting on a cushion posing as the Buddha. 
This was part of the daytime activities before that parade we went to at night with all the lighted lanterns and lighted dragons and stuff. And they had booths. They had hundreds of booths. People were coloring images of Kuan Yin. Um, they were making lotuses. They were um, teaching all different kinds of meditation in little booths, and you could join them. But this was my favorite. Kids were lining up. I mean, this was a long line. And these kids were so excited. They'd sit in this place, pose like the Buddha, and their parents would take pictures of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I think they've got a sense of humor here. <laughs> You know, not, not quite taking themselves so seriously. But this may be our future, eh? <laughs> so I have one last quote here, and I wanted to share something, a little bit that I wrote. Of course, I started with somebody else's quote. Buddhist nun, Tenzin Palmo, states, I don't think that it matters whether the Buddha is male or female. He transcends both in my mind. But if it helps to think about female Buddhas, that's fine. I don't think she's being sarcastic, do you? Then I wrote, for myself, it helps to have a role model to which I can aspire. I thought my career options, my career options, were limited to becoming a school teacher or a nurse. Who aspired to become a Buddha in the 50s? <laughs> Where were the images of freedom and wisdom with which women could identify? And I didn't write this in the book, but where were the images that men could also see women in these roles? So I'd like to leave you with that. I, that's part of my purpose with this book was to help provide a few more images and inspirational thoughts from women teachers.